Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining. My name is Natalie Merritt and I'm the Head of Knowledge Dissemination in Schools at Anna Freud. I want to wel warmly welcome you to our seminar this afternoon, which will focus on our learnings from the Senior Mental Health Lead Training today. At Anna Freud, we endorse a whole school or college approach to mental health and well-being, and we're proud to be a provider of the DfE funded training program to upskill those who are responsible for mental health in their setting. Since 2021, we've trained over 2,600 delegates to implement a whole school approach in their setting, and you'll hear more about this later. So before we go into the agenda, I've just got some quick housekeeping before we make a start. This evening's seminar will be in a webinar format, so all attendee microphones and cameras are switched off. If you'd like to submit a question to our speakers, please pop this into the Q&A function. Our support team will be monitoring the Q&A throughout, so if you have any technical questions, do let us know. Closed captions will also be available for the duration of the webinar, and you can enable and disable these at the bottom of your screen. This seminar will be recorded and it will be shared on the Anna Freud YouTube channel in the next few weeks. Where we have permission from speakers, we will share their presentation slides with you also. And finally, if you're tweeting, our handle is at AFNCCF. Please do tag us and use the schools in mind hashtag. So I am going to, so yeah, here's our email address there and our handle and the hashtag schools in mind. So here is our programme for this evening. I'm delighted to be joined by our experienced panel. And our panel includes colleagues who I work closely with, Rasheen McAvoy and Amy Shelton from our training and national programmes department. We'll also be joined by Emma Shelsey and Ray Chowdhury, two incredibly dedicated senior mental health leads who will be sharing their best practice and learnings with us all. As you can see from the slide, we'll have plenty of time at the end of the seminar for a Q&A with our speakers. Please do add your questions to the Q&A box on screen and we'll do our best to get through as many as we can from 5.30 p.m. onwards. So before we hand over to our wonderful speakers, I just wanted to highlight our recently created Whole School Approach Resource Hub, which sits on our Mentally Healthy Schools website. And this was developed in partnership with and funded by the DfE. The resources on the site are from trusted organisations and, and senior mental health lead training providers, and they aim to support mental health leads to continue to develop their role and better support children and young people to thrive. So to kick off tonight's seminar, I'm pleased to introduce you to Rasheen McAvoy, who's the Head of Schools Training and National Programmes at Anna Freud, and I work really closely with Rasheen. Previously, Rasheen worked in London secondary schools as a teacher and a school leader for 22 years, and now leads a team of education, sorry, education and clinical experts who deliver professional learning and national programmes around whole school approaches to mental health and wellbeing. Thank you for joining us, Rasheen. Going to hand over to you now. Thanks so much, Natalie, and thanks to you and all of the team working behind the scenes for setting up this brilliant opportunity um, for us to all reflect on senior mental health lead um, the train the, the senior mental health lead training program three years in. Um, in terms of context, I wanted to reflect on the last three years a wee bit more generally before talking about senior mental health leads. And I think it's fair to say that the last three years have been challenging for many children and young people and for the staff who work in the schools and colleges and other settings that support them. We've seen rising levels of mental health difficulties among young people, continuing a trend that was recognised before the pandemic. Um, and we've seen increased concern about levels of non-attendance at school. In the UK, we have large numbers of children living in poverty, thought to be around 4.3 million, with a cost of living crisis impacting many families. And schools and colleges have also experienced the impact of rising costs. And in our work every day at Anna Freud, we hear really daily from school staff about the pressures of supporting increasing need of all kinds 
without the resource needed. And we also hear from parents and carers and from young people and children about their experiences of unmet health and educational needs, with some groups being disproportionately affected, for example, neurodivergent young people and young people from minoritized backgrounds. So it's against this indisputably challenging uh, context, this backdrop of challenge, that senior staff in schools and colleges have been working tirelessly to do everything they can to support the well-being and mental health of their students and of their staff. And many have found, and we agree, that the best way to do this is through the implementation of a whole school approach, which Natalie's already mentioned. Um, so a whole school approach to mental health and well-being. And these senior staff have been supported in their role by access to senior mental health lead training. Now, I know not everyone in the seminar today works in a school in England, so I'm going to speak only very briefly to explain the journey that we've been on in the English education system with regard to the senior mental health lead training. So the potential of a whole school approach to mental health and well-being to improve things like attendance and behaviour and attainment, as well as overall well-being, uh, was uh, you know, had long been recognised, but was recognised in the 2017 Government Green Paper, which also announced support for schools to identify and train a senior mental health lead. And this ambition was further realised in 2021 with the beginning of the provision of a DfE grant of £1,200 for each eligible school or setting in England to pay for the costs of training. I think the team are going to share a link to the DfE webpage where you can find out more about that. Um, and to date, I believe around 70% of schools and colleges and other settings have claimed the grant. And there are um, over 60 DfE assured training providers where the schools and colleges can spend that grant. And Anna Freud is one of those. And as Natalie said, we've now trained um, over 3,000 leads. And I think there's a link in the chat going in now um, which is to our page and tell you a bit more about our training. We've also supported the development of senior mental health leads in many other countries across the world um, through partnerships with um, other organisations, for example, the Government of Jersey and with the Nord Anglia group of schools. So we've trained colleagues as far apart as Jersey, Hungary, Poland, the Czech Republic, the US, Mexico, India, Vietnam, Thailand, to name but a few. So we're very proud of this program and the um, impact that it's beginning to be able to make. Um, a word about the role, because Amy's going to say a lot more about the training, but this this proposal or the notion of the role um, in schools of having a senior mental health lead is not about suggesting that school staff should or could become alternate clinicians. Uh, rather, um, that schools can and do um, think about their everyday work of learning and relationships as being absolutely central to the well-being of children and young people. Um, and to do this really well um, takes leadership. Um, so senior mental health leads take that responsibility for the oversight of the whole school approach, including supporting the well-being of the whole school community and planning to meet the needs of those who might need more help. So we're three years into this programme and we thought that now would be a good moment to stop, um, to take stock of what's been achieved and begin to think about what is needed next for this new um, workforce to um, be supported in their work in schools. And what better way to do that than to hear from senior mental health leads themselves. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from Ray and Emma shortly. Um, but also to hear from a senior mental health lead trainer, uh, which leads me to introducing my colleague, Amy Shelton, who's one of our school engagement trainers here, at Anna Freud, and she delivers lots of our training programs, including senior mental health lead and other programs like autism and wellbeing in schools. Amy um, comes from experience of secondary education and also of clinical practice. She worked in schools. Um, had various roles in schools before this, including pastoral and training lead roles. She's also a qualified counsellor and a coach with experience working with children, young people with moderate to more severe need. So I'm going to hang, hand over 
um, to Amy now, who's going to tell you lots more about senior mental health lead training at Anna Freud. Oh, thank you so much, Rasheen. What a, a lovely introduction. So I'm hoping that you can all see these slides okay. Um, someone shout at me if you can't, uh, but let's make sure that is there. Perfect. So um, thank you so much. I'm, I'm going to talk sort of briefly about uh, our training offer, but I really wanted to spend uh, a bit more time today talking about what we've learned from our delegates, the things that kind of makes the, the biggest impact uh, in implementing a whole school approach. So uh, I'll start off just by talking about the training that we have on offer in terms of senior mental health lead training. So you can choose to train on our beginners course, which is a foundation level course. It's two half days. It also includes opportunities to attend smaller group coaching coaching sessions which are broken down into the core areas of work for a senior mental health lead and these coaching sessions are really frequent they run throughout the academic year so let's say if you wanted to set up a mental health action group but you know that you won't be able to roll this out until the next academic year there's nothing stopping you from joining one of these fantastic coaching sessions and bringing along those specific questions then we have our intermediate course so this course has been designed for individuals who have already taken on similar roles before or taken part in similar training and this is two full days of training both courses run frequently online throughout the year however if you are interested in face-to-face -face training and i speak on behalf of all the other school engagement trainers we are always so happy to facilitate this so alongside our courses we have the five steps platform it's a really simple and free tool that education settings can use to support implementing a whole school approach you don't even need to have trained with us or registered to access this it's freely available on our website and as you can see this this breaks it down into five really manageable areas that are central to creating that lasting change within schools and colleges so for those of you that actually have seen this before just make sure you keep revisiting as we are always updating it with the most recent resources and best practice examples including uh, included in this platform we have uh, a really helpful audit tool uh, that again you have to register but it's completely free to use uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this later but this is a really um, really nice way of being able to quite quickly see you know what are the things that you're championing in your setting what areas of the whole school approach and actually what things might need a little bit more work okay so for those of you that are at the beginning of your senior mental health lead journey, um, we often get delegates who are sort of really excited at the end of our training to start this work. They've got lots of ideas, um, but they, they come to us with the question, where should I start? So I thought it would be really interesting to, to consult with some of our senior mental health leads that have created that lasting change in their setting to find out a few of their top tips. So these are a few of the top tips that they shared with me. Ensuring clarity over role, assess the current landscape, highlight priorities, think creatively about CPD and start small. So what I'm going to do is just go through each of those in a little bit more detail. So the first one, ensuring clarity over role. This top tip is for those senior mental health leads who might sit within a school or college system that is maybe there is already an established way of working and it might be a little bit difficult to shift let's say uh, so transparency is is crucial here after the training what we recommend is that you set up a meeting with your line manager or your head and go through those senior mental health lead outcomes uh, they're hyperlinked on this slide so you can see them when you get the slides but also you can go on the government website and, and, and access these but literally go through those outcomes with a highlighter and, and use it as a job description and if there's areas that you know reading through it that you'll need a bit more support with or areas that maybe might already come under someone else's job title then it's really important that both parties make that clear from the outset so just as i said you can you can access this from the government website it's broken down into what leads will learn about so on the training but also what leads will be able to do after the training and these are really tangible concrete things that you could use as a checklist i think i also want to draw your attention to that last bullet point as well you can also use this meeting as an opportunity to discuss who else can help you on this journey of implementing a whole school approach to mental health and well-being it absolutely shouldn't just fall on one person's shoulders it really requires a team effort that of course will have oversight you'll have the oversight of this but establishing this from the get-go who will be part of your team is vital the next top tip was assessing the the current landscape 
So just as it says on the slide, using surveys to help understand the areas of strength and challenge for your setting. And actually at this point, trying to get a really honest understanding of what's happening in your setting in terms of the well-being for students and staff. This assessment process is one of the best ways to find out what the priorities will be for the coming academic year. So really useful for college and school improvement plans. It also serves as a really good baseline measurement that can be rolled out annually. And this will really help you to monitor the impact of the changes that you've made as a senior mental health lead. So the document that I've shared with you on screen is, is one example of this. This is the Cork Staff Wellbeing Survey. It's completely free to use. It's a PDF. You can take the questions and put it into your own form, collate and analyze the data yourself. Uh, but Cork also, if you don't know about them, also offers some amazing packages to support you with this. So student surveys where they'll analyze and compare the data with similar schools in a really accessible report. So you have clarity over your role, you've assessed the current landscape, you should be in a really good position at this point to really highlight your priorities. Now, speaking quite frankly, a lot of senior mental health leads can feel overwhelmed after taking our training. And it's really important that when we talk about implementing a whole school or college approach that we reiterate, this is going to be a work in progress. It's not gonna happen overnight and it should really fit around the other priorities within the school calendar. But a really simple, quick and effective way of getting the ball rolling is to carry out the audit. And I don't mean necessarily filling in the notes, but just doing that RAG rating process. So the audit is underneath those five steps and underneath those kind of five points. You've probably got about five subsections. So about 25 questions in total, if you think about it. And that shouldn't take too long to just decide whether it's red amber or green deciding on on what things actually might need a little bit more work um, but this this quick exercise will really allow you to sort of celebrate and shout about all the amazing things that you're doing already and this is a really common insight that we get from our delegates who have gone away after day one and then they have a go at this and they almost seem shocked to find out actually how much kind of amazing things are happening in their setting already um, and actually very rarely do we find people come back and say that they have to start from the beginning They've, they've just discovered that actually there are these structures and processes that are already in place that this kind of work fit really nicely into. But naturally, the process of RAG rating will also allow you to gain that oversight over where things could be better. And as such, this is quite a fast and effective way to identify those priorities. And I think it also allows you to, to recognize the areas that currently might feel a little bit outside of your experience or skill set. So again, it's another opportunity to think about, well, who can I bring onto my team? Who, whose help will I need with this? OK, the next step thinking creatively about CPD. And when we say CPD, we mean specifically the, the mental health and wellbeing training that should be rolled out to, to staff. And whether that's universally to all of your staff to help them feel more equipped and confident in holding those important spaces and discussions with young people if they want to come and speak to someone about how they're feeling. Or it could be that there is a need for some more specialist training for certain members of staff who work closely with more of your vulnerable students. Now, it might be that you are absolutely best placed to deliver the CPD, but equally it is worth thinking about if there are other experts in your wider school community that can either support you in the design and delivery or take the responsibility themselves. I've currently been working with an attendance officer in a mainstream school who is so passionate about the well-being of autistic students in her setting. She's going to be rolling out two sessions of CPD next year to her whole school. She's so excited about it. And I think that that really draws on the point that there's going to be members of staff who you might not think of straight away, but could absolutely be championing these roles and, and rolling out CPD uh, in your settings. Uh, another top tip we often refer to in our training is to do a bit of research on your local offer. So your ed psych team, you know, they might be best placed to roll out CPD or they might be aware of a, a package that a, a school in the local area has bought into and whether it's been effective or not. So work with them to decide. Mental health support teams, people are often surprised that the mental health support teams or their education healthcare practitioners role, 50% of it is to help you implement the whole school approach to mental health and wellbeing. So they can absolutely help you with CPD. If you're lucky enough to have them in your area. Um, thinking about if there's a senior mental health lead forum in your area where expertise could be shared across schools, what about local charities, utilising parent and carer experts in your community. So really thinking broadly about who can support you with this. 
And then there's considering the format of the CPD. So thinking about, does it fit the need? You know, we could roll out a two hour CPD session after school on a Friday, but actually, is that going to be popular? Um, I've heard of things that are really kind of flexible with this. So coaching cir circles where teachers who all might share the responsibility of care for a particular student, they meet, they discuss, they share things which have been working. You know, it could be 10 minutes once a week. And, and often this is a really empowering process. I've heard of send surgery where people can drop in to discuss what they need to adapt to support particular students that they teach. So the format of this doesn't have to be that kind of traditional after school offer. It's how can it fit in and how can it really meet the need? Um, then there's the training and the resources that you use. So how you develop the training. And we would always advise that the training, again, meets the need of your staff and students. So using that survey feedback or even soft data, go out and speak to staff, students, parents, carers, and ask them what would they like staff to, to learn more about, to know more about. And we really recommend tailoring the training to meet the need of the setting. But obviously, it should always be informed by an evidence base, ensuring that any material delivered in CPD is obviously safe and inclusive. Okay, step five, starting small. So lastly, starting small. For those of you who might work in settings where you feel there may be a few barriers to change uh, and you might feel a bit limited in what responsibility you have, we really do suggest starting small and demonstrating success. What are the easy wins that you can celebrate and may, may, maybe even entice those more resistant or prickly customers to join your cause? We're aware that change doesn't happen overnight uh, and part of your role might actually to build, be to build momentum them, getting other members of staff on board uh, with the whole school approach. So here are a few examples of small steps that might just get that buy-in. Uh, we've got setting up a mental health and wellbeing group. Again, this can start small. Um, we've got lots of resources to help you on our, on our step two, working together on the five steps. Staff wellbeing champions. And if you can, try involving some of those more louder voices in the staff room. Rolling out universal interventions. So I've put on here our classroom wellbeing toolkit. It's a fantastic toolkit. It's got really simple, practical um, strategies, interventions that you could literally take and implement the next day and they would have a, a really, really positive impact. Starting a parent and care group. Parent and carers have a huge influence and getting them on side is obviously always a big win. Um, a big one is recruiting a mental health and wellbeing governor. This is something that really helps sustain that, that implementation of the, the whole school approach, it keeps it on the agenda. And then that last point there, so make, make sure staff and students know who you are. Ask if you can introduce yourself in assembly or staff briefing, or if possible, add your own section onto school newsletters or even the website. So make sure people know that you are the senior mental health lead. So I really enjoyed finding out about the, the kind of wins and the, the, the top tips from our senior mental health leads. Um, but it, it drew to my attention that actually a lot of you who have trained to be senior mental health leads can sometimes be a bit of a one person army. And we often get feedback after our training that it was really invigorating to spend that time with colleagues equally as passionate about supporting the mental health and well-being of children and young people. And that's why we really encourage you to, to continue that networking. So using things like Disciple, this is our platform for senior mental health leads that have trained with us. It's very much like Facebook. You have your own cohort group, the group that you trained with, but also a community page where you can ask and answer questions and find out the latest from our trainers in terms of resources, opportunities to take part in free training. You can sign up for further reflective and coaching sessions there too. Uh, for those of you that haven't maybe revisited Disciple in a while, please do come back to us. As I said, we're always posting and showcasing new resources. Uh, it could also be that in terms of networking, you might be fortunate enough to sit in a local authority where there might be a senior mental health lead forum. I recently heard in Somerset, the mental health support teams had put together an informal meeting for the senior mental health leads to all get together, to get to know that the mental health support team, speak about what the local offer was, share best practice and, and kind of network. So definitely keep an eye out for opportunities to network with other leads. So my last slide, I thought it would be quite valuable to share straight from our feedback form uh, what senior mental health leads have found valuable from the training. Um, and I'll just kind of talk through the highlights of these. There's, there was a lot of really positive feedback, but I thought these three quotes did a really good job at just summarising. So that first one, 
uh, the, the kind of key takeaways from that first session is to get those foundations in and the walls that you build will be strong in, in bold at the end there. I really love that idea of getting the foundations right, the everyday, the preventative, the early intervention so that the rest will be strong. And we hear that so much. Many of us are in positions of firefighting and reacting with long waiting lists for specialist provision. Well, what could we do in our settings to maybe put some resources towards the preventative to prevent the escalation? That next one, so looking at creating a, a mental health and wellbeing policy, and, and it says there with student voice at the heart. So you know you're demonstrating your commitment to supporting the mental wellbeing, um, their mental wellbeing, and, and holding yourself to account as a school for this. And then that last one there, creating a mental health and wellbeing group. So let's give autonomy to our, our students, our staff, and ensure that we're not alone in implementing a whole school approach to mental health and wellbeing. Thank you so much. I'm going to hand back over to Natalie now. I stop sharing my slides. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. First of all, Rasheen, thank you for your really incredible, helpful overview of the training and the context in which school and college staff are currently operating in. And Amy, thank you so much for your really clear and practical insights into the training um, and also really helpful tips for leads that they might want to take forward um, and think about in their settings. Um, I can already see some questions coming in from attendees on the call, so I look forward to speaking to both of you a little bit later for the Q&A. So I'm going to move on now. And we're going to hear directly from two wonderful senior mental health leads who have trained with us and have implemented some of this knowledge and some of the, um, the tips that Amy was talking through. Um, and they've used, you know, the five steps framework and they've implemented some of that learning into their school communities. So First of all, I'm really delighted to welcome Emma Shelsey. And Emma serves as the Senior Mental Health Lead at St Vincent's Primary School in Mill Hill, which is in Barnet. In addition to her role, she fulfills various responsibilities, including safeguarding lead and year six teacher. Emma is dedicated to utilising the Department for Education's eight principles to ensure that every child has the opportunity to achieve their fullest potential. We're really pleased to have you here this evening, Emma. So I'm going to hand over to you now. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'll just start my slides. You can see them. Great. OK, so um, thank you for my introduction. I feel very fancy now. Um, I thought I'd just start by saying that in, in schools, I feel like majority of people on this call, you won't ever be doing just one job. Um, and I thought that I'd share with you that I want you to know that if you're at the start of this journey or if you're in the middle of this journey, you've been doing it for a few years, that you'd be surprised how much you already are doing. And actually, it's not sort of another thing to add on, but it sort of complements everything you are doing and just helps your school and the children there reach their full potential. At St. Vincent's, we're big believers if children are mentally in a good place, then academically they will continue to achieve. So today I was asked to um, talk about the practical steps, but I thought, let me just say a little bit about myself. The school that I attend, I actually was a pupil at. Um, it was always a dream to come and work here. Um, I am year six teacher, everything that was mentioned before. I also have become a staff governor. So that has also opened my eyes to a, a different world in terms of what um, we, we see at St. Vincent's for the mental health and well-being side of things. So what are the practical steps we've taken? It was quite hard to put it all into one slide, which I'm sure a lot of your schools also might find the same when you think about what you have done. But when I think back to the very beginning and after the training, the training was a good start. And for a moment, I'll be honest, it did feel overwhelming. However, when you then take a step back and you realise, actually, we should start small. So I'm sort of echoing what was said before. But I would really recommend starting with an audit. Um, there's Anna Freud's audit. There are There's a whole school approach, like a national one you could use. There's something called CoLab, which I've linked in. Um, and that is where you can almost start, even though you might have things in place. But that is where I would just start to say, sort of give yourself a confidence boost and go, OK, actually, we are doing a lot. But what else can we do? Or how can we refine what we are doing so we're not trying to do too many things at once? 
um, what we looked at to start with was also then our policies. And we looked at actually, maybe we need to change our policies. We had a behavior policy. Then we looked at, we need a specific policy on mental health and well-being. We also discovered that we needed a policy on racial justice, equality and diversity. And then further to that, a separate anti-racism policy. And that is something we are still working on three years on. So it, it is going to change. But what I would highly recommend is anything that you decide to um, change with policies is ensure that you liaise with multiple people in your staff as you would, but also your governors. And then we found very positive feedback by actually involving parents. And eventually we got to a point this year where we actually, where we involved children um, with our behavior policy and they gave feedback and then they, ch the children were actually able to put in place what they believe the system should be. If they were not regulated, how can we help them get back on track? Um, one of the key takeaways from listening to the children was actually it's the language we are using. And as adults, we're so conditioned. And I think sometimes we don't realize to focus on the negative. Whereas actually, if we start highlighting the positives, um, you might have a class where a child's not listening or you've got some children doing their work. It can be so simple as teaching yourself to say, well done. Um, you've opened your book well done you've started your lesson and already it can make your teachers feel a bit different about their lessons rather than get your book open I've asked this I've asked that and sometimes the more you've been teaching you can actually forget about those things so speaking to the children really helped us review how we support them with their behavior and it helped us understand that behavior was a form of communication um, and what was happening is we were bringing we were listening to children each, in each class and then bringing that back to our senior leadership meetings and then deciding right what can we do with that how can we get the whole school on board because let's put it this way our reception children say very different things to our year six children um, but it's it's always good to hear what you can do and it's also making sure that you're very honest with the children and say that this takes a long time and there will still be errors and there is still a it's a journey um, not to use that word but it is and same with parents and I'll be honest when you are proactive instead of reactive even with policies such as anti-racism it can bring up a lot that you've maybe not acknowledged in your school before you weren't aware of and it could be tough in the beginning but that's where for example actually even that that disciple um online platform actually really helps to get further information and i must say not just trying to give um five gold stars to anna Freud, but they have a lot of resources where if you are stuck with anything, you can genuinely Google it and Anna Freud will always be your top thing that comes up to give you advice. Um, so I've sort of touched on people and staff voice, but one thing we also did was we changed our questions for our children. We used to have questions that went from reception to year six and actually the training made us realize you can't really have the same questions for upper key stage two and lower key stage two. Depends on your school size, for example, but there were questions for year sixes and year threes that year threes maybe didn't have the same understanding because of their knowledge about mental health and well-being so that was a really good insight um also being able to listen to the staff i think now because people are talking more about mental health and well-being there's sometimes with certain staff people don't actually still know how to react to it as adults and it's trying to make everyone comfortable and if they're not understanding what you can do as a leader to support them that was um what i took away from the training was sometimes when it can take people longer to get on board they just need more evidence so stick to it keep going keep your vision clear and eventually they will come around um what i also thought was really good when after we had the training we decided that we were we were doing a lot in school but who knows about it so we actually included on our website a tab where um, when you go onto our school website, it's called Wellbeing. And it tells anyone who looks at our website all the different services that we could access. And um, they can click then directly on the link to the services in case they're not ready to approach the school. It tells them who your senior mental health lead is, who your mental health first aiders are. That was one key thing as well, ensuring that parents and children know who they are. And we also um, sort of signposted them to resources, um, whether it was 
um, my mind blank there, forgive me, whether it was um, if there was a child with selective mutism, where to go with that, if it was parents need support with managing bedtimes, because we, from feedback that we got from parents, a lot of children were struggling to go to bed and that's because they were having nightmares. So it was, again, listening to parents, listening to pupils and then trying to put that onto our website. It also made us realise that we, we, we started... We have briefings at school and we actually used to have one every single morning. And we then, they were just more of a meeting of you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do this, you need to do that. And we realized actually, let's cut them down. So we changed our meeting e e meetings each day. And one key thing, um, which I learned from the training was actually have an agenda and make sure you're always going to, into a meeting with a clear idea of what the point of it and what you can do so that people don't feel overwhelmed. Um, so our training se sessions for staff would be small and then followed on. So they weren't just, right, this week is one thing. The next thing will be something different. We also brought in outside agencies. We tapped into our EPs. We also tapped into our mental health support teams. Please use them. They, as senior mental health leads, please don't try and do everything. I think I tried to do that at my school and thought, wow, am I qualified for this? Who am I to be saying it? But actually, you've got so many people that you can go to. And if you can't, email, get be part of that disciple group and find someone who can help you. Um, collaborating with families and local community, that sometimes can be very hard because mental health and wellbeing, some people aren't ready to talk about. But I'll be honest, that particular one, um, that point takes years to try and continue working with them. But I would start small by having a listening group um, you might have a coffee morning try and just get the first group if you've not done one before just to be a listening group and hear what the staff uh, the parents have to say um, what I'd also recommend with that is ensure that if a parent you know those parents that you're thinking of that would be very vocal which everyone has and you sometimes need but ensuring that if they've got a particular issue that you've got a facilitator of your listening group that can say right that is a particular issue so you would need to go to the head teacher for that today is just a listening so we can see what the needs of the school are um working with the local community that sometimes can be a bit of a harder one um but as a catholic school we were able to link with our churches um and we've got to a point now where our the priests have actually asked we have mental health champions in school and they've asked those children to come down to the church and deliver a powerpoint a workshop to the parishioners so depending on your community it's it's seeing what's out there seeing what you think would be good but sometimes I think getting the children out there is a great way to bring people in we also reviewed how we measure well-being I apologize if I'm speaking fast it's um a habit of mine. I'm very passionate. Um, but we looked at measuring well-being. We would gather all the pupils' feedback and then we wouldn't really, we just have all this information and we'd have no idea what to do with it. Um, the the Anna Freud sort of training or the senior mental health training made us realize that don't look at all the points. Make sure you're looking at the positive and then choose three things you might work on for that term or the next two terms. And then as a result of that, ensure you show to your pupils a you said we did. So for example, we had the children complaining about our playground. Um, they said that there wasn't really much to do. We don't have anything to play with and that's why we're getting into arguments. So then we were able to get um, raise money for the PTA, put in playground markings, playground equipment. And then obviously that was a physical you said we did they could see what we did but we still did it in an assembly to help them feel like they had been listened to something else we rolled out was you can't listen to children all the time and teachers workload is a lot and you're not there to solve everything you're there to support the children and safeguard them but there's only so many hours in the day so we had this idea of having for upper key stage two having emotions book so it's literally a book that is private between the child and the teacher and we make sure they're locked in the cupboards um, so that the child knows that no one else is reading them. But once you develop that trust in your class, their children feel a bit more confident to keep it with them and then write in it whenever they can. If you do decide to use that, please don't always choose it after that one rainy day when it's break time and they've, the child's had their worst break ever. Change the timings that you do it um, so you get an understanding. It's, it's sometimes where, you know, when the children have gone on holiday for a week and actually you do not know what they have done and if they are okay, depending on what the child wants to tell you. So sometimes that emotions book really taps into it. When they are younger, you sometimes need to provide sentence starters, but as they're older, they become a lot 
a lot more independent. Um, and for key stage one, we tend to use circle time. And um, we still use that in our key stage two. I'd never underestimate circle time, guys, and literally getting into a circle. Also, I've been on training recently where they say do that with the adults as well to be to to really try and create that trust and that bond. Um, we also looked at our safeguarding meetings. We looked at how can we, from what we are doing in our safeguarding meetings, how can that roll out into the curriculum? How can that roll out into what we are teaching? Um, that can take a while, but what we notice is whatever safeguarding system you used, if there were um, a lot of things that kept happening, that maybe might have been our focus that term. Um, so for example, there was a phase with our year six children where there was an issue with WhatsApp groups and that was then impacting the children's learning at, at home. Um, so then that was where we decided to tap into our mental health support team. They came in, was able to deliver some sessions as were we, and then support the children that way. And also sending out, always send out information to the parents, let them know what you guys are doing so they can feel supported. We're also looking at um, becoming a trauma-informed school. Um, I won't go too much into detail about that now, but that's something I'd um, like to, if anyone would like to contact me after, we can talk about. One key thing from the training is always keep monitoring and evaluating what you are doing. Um, being aware of that, like what is the impact? How can you notice the difference? And that's really hard sometimes with well-being, And that is an ongoing thing that we are learning at St. Vincent's and from other mental health leads that we have learned. Um, but the more you do it over, over months, you will feel more confident with it. Um, we also started a wellbeing team. That was brilliant. So we have um, PE, the EYFS team and PSHE lead. And then we also have a link governor. So they meet, they actually meet once a week. The governor comes in twice a term and we look at the whole school um, to see what we need to put in place. Um, I'd also say restorative justice is a key thing. That's something that can change your whole mental health school approach because it's getting the children and the parents to understand that behavior is a form of communication and it gets the children to really realize that actually sometimes someone's having a bad day and unfortunately they took it out on you or they don't have that same understanding. So it, that's been a real positive in our school. Um, but yes, keep working with parents, speaking to them, communication is key. And we created a mental health hub at our school. So we get senior mental health leads that come in here. Try and find a hub in your community, in your borough. Um, even if it's, it will start with two or three people and then it will get bigger because you'll all find you're having the same issues and you'll then be able to support each other with solutions. And I would highly, highly recommend mental health champions. Have a group across year six, year five that, they, they go around the school, they deliver workshops on zones of regulation, they deliver workshops um, on, again, restorative justice. So whatever we're sort of trying to drive in school, we don't always get the children to hear it from us. We try and get them to hear it from the children, because especially the younger children, they're thinking, right, year six is our goal. So now I must listen to these children um, instead of those boring adults that are telling us the same thing all the time. Um, but communication is key. You need to make sure parents, children, your staff know what you are doing, because I can guarantee you will be doing an amazing job. Just make sure you're not taking it all on yourself. Um, it's becoming a senior mental health leader and attending this training completely changed how we do it at school and how we also viewed ourselves and knowing that we can do this and we are supporting the children. And it also made us realize how we needed to support their transition to secondary school. Um, so it's making sure one of our focus is looking also at the long-term concerns as part of your whole school approach and how can you prevent them. Um, so yeah, sorry that I know I was speaking at you trying to get as much information as possible. I hope that either inspired you or gave you some ideas. Um, but thank you. Thank you very much. I am more than happy for anyone to contact me. I've actually put my personal email because I think that you are all doing a great job, whether it's your start or you're in the middle of it or you're very experienced. We, we need each other. Um, and I want to say a big thank you to Anna Freud because their resources have really helped what we do in school. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Emma. Thank you. That was an incredible presentation. Um, I, yeah, I think there's so many nuggets of wisdom that you shared that we can take away there. Um, I, I really loved your positive and pragmatic approach around how you've implemented the learnings from the training. Um, and also great to hear that you've been able to utilize the networking platform on Disciple. 
I think a key takeaway for me um, is probably just that you were able to really, you and your colleagues were able to stop, listen, learn from um, and really work collaboratively with the pupils and parents and carers in your setting. So yeah, I think you'll definitely inspire others on the call, but also I think maybe reassure those that are on the call and that they're already maybe doing really amazing things and um, to support the mental health and well-being of their own communities. So thank you so much, Emma. I am now going to move on and um, I'm going to hand over to Ray. Let me just see. Um, Emma, are you able to stop sharing your slides? Thank you. Okay. Right. So I'm going to introduce Ray. Ray has been a teacher for 35 years, having spent all of her career in inner London secondary schools. Starting out as a drama teacher, Ray is now a deputy head teacher with responsibility for teaching and learning, inclusion, performing arts, admissions, transitions, and uh, for the past five years, the wellbeing and mental health lead at Haggerston School in Hackney. Ray, really pleased to have you on the call this evening. I'll hand over to you now. Thank you. Can you just let me know if you can hear me and see my slides? I can hear you and I can see the slides. Lovely. Thank Brilliant. you very much. Okay. Um, thank you very much, everyone. And thank you, um, Anna Freud. I, I think, um, as you kind of introduced, <laughs> made me sound like I do a lot. Um, I will make the point that my colleague actually just made earlier on that, you know, when I trained to be a teacher hundreds of years ago, I trained to be a drama teacher and that's the only qualification I have. So without the mental health training provided for me, I think um, we would be in a very different position. So yeah, thank you very much. It's absolutely worthwhile. So um, I work in a secondary school in Hackney. We have over a thousand um, young people. 54 different languages and uh, well above national average for PPI um, in old money. We call that free school meals um, and young people with additional needs. Uh, we got good at our last Ofsted and the Ofsted before. So we're kind of a probably a, quite an average um, big old secondary school in inner London. And because of that, we, uh, we have quite a big team. So it's interesting to hear people talking about being one person bands, if you like. Um, here there's quite a lot of us, although we might not be, uh, well-being and mental health might not be in our title. I kind of, I think one of the things that I have done is gone out and recruited people to work with me. So there's myself, who's the designated um, mental health lead. And then I'm lucky enough to have one of the safeguarding team that does a bit of work um, in terms of being a well-being coordinator. Um, and then I've co-opted the safeguarding leads to support us. And then because we are in Hackney, we have um, we're in quite a privileged position that Hackney have something called WAMS, which is Wellbeing and Mental Health in School. And that means that one day a week I have a CAMS worker and you'll hear me talk about the CWIS, uh, but that, that's our CAMS worker in school and our EMP, which is our educational mental health professional. So I have two professionals uh, that come in one day a week um, that I'm able to use as resources. And then um, I would also use uh, the clinical team lead um, for the city and Hackney mental health support team. I'll use that young and that person for advice and then the WAMS lead at the borough. So, so what we say to um, our staff when they join is we kind of talk about what um, Public Health England say, which is that in a class of 15 year olds, you might well have three young people with a diagnosis of clinical depression. You might have 10 young people that have witnessed a parent separation. One could have experienced death of a parent. Seven are likely to have been bullied and six may be self-harming. And, and we don't do that to frighten staff, but to kind of make them aware of kind of the setting and what young people are carrying with them. I think this is kind of uh, the most stark picture and, and the reason why wellbeing and mental health in schools and Anna Freud in particular play such a big part of education nowadays. So you can see that um, sort of 2018 and 19, um, just before I was in post, um, our referrals were 606. Um, 
and with mental health concerns, 96, but kind of that's 76 pupils. And then you can fast forward to today and you can see that our mental health um, referrals have gone up to 562. And that's kind of looking at 261 pupils. So that is a 485% in referrals um, since COVID really. And I know this is a national picture. We know those of us that work with young people that um, post COVID, the world looks very different for young people and their parents. Um, I think possibly we have a better referral system. So we have much more reporting of concerns. And I think because we um, are a WAM school, we have more interventions and maybe that's a reason why we still have such high numbers. So I just kind of wanted to explain briefly how we track and kind of action and um, check impact um, with any young person that is referred uh, for a well-being and mental health um, concern. So we, we have a core team. We have the WAMS team, which might be the CAMS worker in school and myself. Then we have a member, we have the SENCO as part of the inclusion department. We have a member of staff that looks after behaviour and attendance. And then we have the safeguarding team. And we meet every week. And that meeting is sacrosanct. We, we never don't meet. And then the very first thing we do is we look at the new referrals and then try to, try to triage them. So we identify the right support for each individual. Um, we ensure that there's joined up thinking. We review the support the next week. And then if necessary, we'll escalate that to a multi-agency meeting. So if we have a concern about our young person, there's lots of different things that we do. So I think when I was writing all these things down, when you think maybe you're starting on your journey, you already know that as a school, regardless, you put so much in place for a young person and their well-being. Um, you know, from having a conversation with the student, you have a tutor check in, maybe some year team support, the parental phone call home, a pastoral meeting. If a young person has an additional need, get the inclusion team involved and then the referral to our group. And what happens then is we have lots of different um, documents out. And when we get the referral, we do lots of cross checking. So we might ask for a round robin and ask all the different teachers because a young person could have up to 15 different teachers and see if they've noticed anything that concerns them. We always cross reference with um, progress. So we'll look at their assessments and see if their behaviours or their concern are affecting their learning in the classroom. Um, we might get inclusion to check barriers for learning. That might be a little bit of SALT intervention or a LUCID test. And then we have some kind of low stakes support. We have um, professional friends who are sixth form mentors. Or we have a group of staff that are able to mentor from our engagement team. We um, use SilverCloud, which is an online sixth form um, online um, support platform. But that's targeted just for our sixth form. We might get the uh, safeguarding lead to check in and, and then one of the things that we are kind of doing much more regularly now because of sort of the level of need is to try and encourage parents to use sort of medical and GP intervention often parents contact us and sort of say I'm worried about my child this is how they're acting what are you going to do as a school and while we want to do as much as we can Sometimes we need to say to the parent, you know, have you thought about taking them to the GP? See if you can get support from outside. Um, we run different types of sessions, which I'll talk to you about later. Um, we have the capacity to run one to one sessions with individuals. And then there's some outside um, initiatives that I've brought in that have been really successful, which I'll talk about a little bit later, including something called Tree of Life and the Smiling Boys Project. And we also work with outside providers like Young Hackney. We are lucky enough to have seven days um, across the five days um, of ASPACE, which is our therapeutic counselling service, which works with young people on a one-to-one -one basis for a period of time. We always have a big waiting list. And that is also open to staff as well. And then we can always count on CAMS referrals um, as part of, which is what our CAMS worker in school supports us with. So like to think of our school as a healthy school or what a, a healthy school would look like. It's interesting um, talking about language. We found that if we talk about well-being and mental health, many parents find the mental health phrase difficult. So we kind of talk about being a healthy school and we talk about students' well-being. 
and kind of don't focus so much on, on the words mental health because of the connotations that it has in our community. So we make sure that there's a lot of display around the school so students have the visual that we are concerned about their well-being. We make sure that assemblies, that it's made clear where they can get support from. Our curriculum, we did a curriculum audit when we kind of began this journey in 2019 and tracked areas in which well-being is covered. Um, we have drop down character days, which are our PSHE days, if you like. And in those days, we cover aspects of well-being and mental health. We have done staff training and all of our TAs have, be, have had their psychological uh, first aid training. Um, and we decided that actually early intervention, that transition is really important rather than kind of so front loading well-being and being healthy is better than crisis management when they get to their exams in year 11 and year 13. So we use A-Space um, to do transition groups. We use Young Hackney for transition groups. And we also build in um, work during summer school. Um, we have bespoke um, interventions for key groups. So for instance, in our referrals meetings, if we're seeing, which we did last year, um, sort of a trend in which quite a few young people didn't want to eat in the canteen, only wanted to eat in private so no one could sort of see the meeting or were struggling with food. Um, we would talk to the um, EMP as part of the WAMS team to see if they could devise maybe a series of sessions and workshops to deal with um, sort of eating, which is, which is what they did. Um, we have a wellbeing week. And so um, once a term, no, sorry, once a year, we have a whole week in which the focus is wellbeing. We don't set homework for key stage three. Um, we encourage young people to leave at the end of the day. And during the day and uh, before school starts, we have a whole range of things that happen. And I'll show you a, a poster of that later on. Um, one of the things that I think has been really useful is we have built in enrichment. So rather than asking young people to stay behind after school, which they can do to do extracurricular activities or miss their lunchtime, which again they can do, on a Friday, our last lesson is an enrichment lesson. So every young person gets to do something, whether it's film club or table tennis or football or debate society or chess. And that's built into their kind of their entitlement. And, and we found that that's really helpful. And then obviously, it's really important to inform, educate and celebrate. So we make sure that all the things we do, the staff know about through bulletins. And then we have a parent forum but we also have parent bulletins. So we regularly send out all the things that are happening so parents know. More recently, um, this year, we have decided to have um, a much more high profile well-being, um, yeah, well-being profile at all school events. So at parents' evenings or parent information evenings, we will have either myself or one of the safeguarding team or um somebody else from the wellbeing team available so that parents can speak to us. Um, again, talking about sort of front loading training, we offer universal training, particularly to year seven, um, and we delivered anxiety training um, right across year seven. I think we took them out of um, each tutor group out of an English lesson. So that's like 55 minutes, a single lesson where the entirety of year seven in their tutor groups we're able to kind of do some work around sort of transition and feelings of anxiety. Um, I think it was mentioned earlier on in um, this session about how many of our young people are um, not coming to school and this kind of um, emotional based, emotional school based avoidance has become quite a thing for us. And so we have been using um, our CAMS worker to kind of look at the language that we use when we're speaking to students and speaking to parents. Um, we've also created reflective spaces, which are like supervision, but we can't call them that for our TAs, who kind of often work, um, you know, sort of with our most challenging young people. And we've also provided that same space for discussion and reflection with our early careers framework teachers. Uh, that's kind of once a term. Um, we have something called the Tree of Life, which I'm going to talk to you about in a minute. Um, we're currently running a, a year seven and eight boys anxiety group, and we are getting to have a mental health professional in parent meetings and referral meetings. And we found that very useful. So let me just talk to you about the Tree of Life. 
Um, I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's a psychosocial support tool. It was developed in South Africa and it uses the tree as a metaphor to represent different aspects of participants' lives. We um, were most concerned about our young people from African and Caribbean heritage backgrounds, particularly our boys. Um, they um, sort of the data was showing us that they were quite disengaged. And we know that um, young people from this background in particular really found it difficult to access mental health services. So we ran this session for each year group um, over the course of two years. And um, the impact has been it's been very well received, uh, so much so that we are now running a neurodiverse group. So the same um, narrative practice, but with young people that identify um, either with ADHD or possibly um, autism. Um, summer school. Um, this is a picture of Alice, one of our wellbeing workers, delivering um, a friendship session um, to the year sixes as they come into year seven. And then this is a picture of the anxiety training that the year sevens experienced as well. Um, this is wellbeing week. You can see I've got some, I've got a yoga teacher in and that's some year 10 boys doing yoga. It's an image of our display. Um, and then there's an image of um, the big quiz. So we had our, our big hall and we set up like a quiz with prizes at lunchtime. And then one of the most popular things was the mindful colouring that we set up in the library before school, after school and at lunchtime. And then that's the big list of all the members of staff that volunteered their time to just kind of do something positive to be kind to yourself that students took up. And then just very finally, I'm a drama teacher, um, a school production. This year we did The It, which is a story about a young person um, with um, mental health needs. And what we did, so we did the production, but we also then added a workshop before and afterwards and invited year seven students from other schools and um, used it as like a stepping stone or a way in to kind of talking about their own needs and their own mental health. I'm just going to leave you finally with some feedback um, from students who have been using um, some of our mental health services. So I've talked too much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ray. You definitely didn't talk too much. <laughs> it was a really, really brilliant presentation. So thank you for being so generous with sharing all of your extensive experience with us. Um, it sounds like you've created a real positive um, and very supportive culture across the whole school community. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for sharing. We've had a couple of questions for you specifically, Ray, also, which I'm going to come to shortly. So I'm now going to move on to our Q&A section of the evening. Thank you so much for staying with us, everyone who's on the call. There is still time to put in any questions if you would like to. I can see some coming in, but please feel free to use the Q&A uh, function at the bottom if you have any more. So what I'm going to do now is welcome everyone back, all of the panel. If you can come back and put your screens on, that would be great. Uh, we've had a brilliant response from the audience this evening and there are lots of interesting questions. So um, the first one that I'm going to start off with is, is actually for Emma. And someone has asked, how are you continually measuring impact in your school? If you don't mind sharing. So I shared that. So measuring, Im measuring the impact has been actually one of the hardest things. But what we do is we use Google surveys for sort of generic ideas to be able to measure the children's impact. Um, we also use um, strength and difficulties questionnaires for children who go to interventions. Um, and we also use their academic achievement as an idea to see if things have actually worked. But we do struggle with methods, but our audit also helps us as a school um, to sort of measure where we are, where we've got to go and how far. But that is something that we're discussing at the moment in different groups to try and find other methods. But again, it's trying to not do too many and finding what works for your school. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I don't know, if Ray, if you've got anything to add around well, how you sort of measure well-being in your school. I mean, I think obviously secondary school a little bit different, but um, the referrals and the data. So, so we're looking at data, behaviour data. We're looking at progress data. Um, 
yeah so if we if we put an intervention in place and then that, that young person then doesn't need any more support and is doing well so yeah so it's it is the whole the whole of sort of the well-being agenda is data driven thank you um i don't know if rasheen or amy you've got anything to add around a measurement no that's fine i'm going to move on to the next question oh rasheen sorry oh um, i will well uh, I, I thought Amy was going to come in there. But, um, <laughs> I mean, I, I suppose what I would say is I think Emma and Ray have have given uh, excellent suggestions and have both acknowledged that it's different measures for different types of um, activity or intervention. Um, and I think it is a challenge. Um, I think some it has been mentioned in presentations to look at the work of Cork, which is part of Anna Freud, which provide quite a lot of resources that can support you when thinking about um, measurement and uh, measuring impact of the different activities that you're doing in school. Yeah, I think that's a really, really good point. And uh, we could actually put some signposts into Cork in the chat for people as well, because I would highly recommend um, Cork for support with measurement. Um, OK, so moving on to the next question, um, someone asked specifically for Ray, how did you manage to get a CAMS worker to come into your school, Ray? I, yeah, I know. I'm incredibly lucky. Um, it's because we're part in Hackney, we're part of this WAMS project. So well-being and mental health in schools. And part of it was that we had we have a CAMS worker one day a week and we have this educational mental health professional that can do face to face work with young people and they run our groups. So it's because we're in Hackney. I, I believe that other boroughs in London are sort of um, trying to kind of go ahead and use the model, but the connection between CAMS and secondary schools anyway is absolutely invaluable. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and someone has also asked uh, if there is any more evidence they can find out around the, yeah, more about the evidence base for the Tree of Life um, programme that you mentioned. Yes, interestingly, because we were in the pilot so they, they've done an evaluation report with their impact, um, and I have that. So I'm very willing to, to sort of send it to you, and then anybody that wants to can have a read of it, um, because, it's again, it's got, it, it lays it all out. It's got the data. It's got case studies. It's really powerful reading. Thank you. Yeah, we'd be happy to disseminate that with the information after the, the um, seminar. Emma? Sorry, I just wanted to add on the CAMS worker in schools. We used to have one in primary school um, and unfortunately the funding, so it cut. But if you tap into your mental health support teams, hopefully it's in your borough. But they also do come in. That's something that happens at our school. And depending on how comfortable your senior mental health lead, they'll continue to come in and support you. And they actually do put in place for you. They might support you with your audit, what the school needs are. Um, you go through a sort of list with them in line with your audit and the eight principles and they can support you with that. Um, but you, you, depending on who your supervisor is, try and push that and they can be really supportive and it can go really well. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that, Emma. I think it's definitely, um, it's a real lottery around, yeah, wh where you are and if you can access them, but it's, it's great to know that you were able to do that also. Um, and then I've got a few questions here. I've got another one for Ray, uh, which is, have you noted any positive impacts on staff's mental health and well-being within this work? And I think also I'll ask Emma that as well. I think that's a really, really good question. Um, what we haven't, we have started to do the um, wellbeing charter um, and we haven't finished that. So we haven't collected as much information as we need to about staff wellbeing, but I know that staff so, so one of the things I didn't mention is that I'm sure most schools do this, but we have a staff wellbeing week as well, in which we have we put on free breakfast for everybody, and um, we hire a we've hired in the past a um, a massage, a masseuse, and staff have been able to in their non-contact time sign up and have like um, yeah a massage. Um, so and then we put yoga on as well. So we so we um, and then I think but I know that the ECTs. And the TAs in particular have been very grateful for the reflective spaces that we've offered. So I don't have data about that. Um, I know they think it's positive. I'm sure we could do a lot more. Thank you, Ray. 
And Emma, how about you? Is there um, any impact that you've seen on I think staff? The start, I think the start of it was that actually staff started to admit that they felt overwhelmed with the workload, that it's not just workload, it's trying to manage all these children's issues and parents' anxieties on top of that, and also have their own life, etc. So at first, the positives was actually just having a space where the teachers were able to share that information. We usually do once a term of breakfast where no one's allowed to talk about work and you just talk about whatever you want while eating croissants and fruit um we also used to offer um an occasional day where so like near christmas time or any time of year you could take one day off um which staff really loved and that was a positive impact but then now due to staffing we haven't been able to do that but we try and if someone is feeling overwhelmed we listen to them and they might see say can you have an hour out can we do this for you um it's trying to work with yourself but it's one of the hardest to really notice the the positive impact so it's something we're working on thank you both for sharing and I think we we know from sort of our work and I'm sure Amy and Rasheen you hear this all the time but it's um it's definitely the part that sort of gets left behind sometimes I feel with the whole school approach it's because you're all so um busy and you you care and you're so passionate about your pupils mental health and well-being um I feel like it's often the the area that that might kind of fall by the wayside sometimes but obviously it's so important thank you for sharing um I've got a question I'm gonna pass to um to Amy and Rasheen um maybe I'll start with Amy but um uh, really this is kind of building on some of the things that Emma was saying about engaging parents and carers but what would you say is the first step in engaging parents and carers around mental health and well-being this is a, a really interesting question. Um, and I think on a lot of other trainings that we do, we see this come up in so many of our other trainings. It's, it's a real challenge of how to engage uh, parents and carers. And I think um, someone put it really well once in a training, one of our delegates said, it's about stepping out of your role, um, actually, when you're working with a parent and carer, uh, because I don't think we realise how many sort of symbols of authority and power we, we carry with us just in even how we introduce ourselves as Miss Shelton and sitting behind the desk and the big chair. And I think when we're working with parents and carers, the first thing you have to do is really think about how you can facilitate a space where you can build that trust because it doesn't actually come really easily uh, for some parents and carers and it's usually the ones where you have to consciously think about how to build that trust that are the harder the harder to reach parents so I would say it's it's about building trust and consciously thinking about what things you can do to take away those sort of scary elements those symbols of power those those authoritative kind of status things um yeah that would be the kind of first step thank you amy do you have anything to add to that machine i think those are brilliant um sort of suggestions brilliant first step suggestions from amy and um, amy's slightly hiding her light behind a bushel because amy's done a really important piece of work for us working alongside colleagues from the Anna Freud sponsored Pairs Family School, which is our alternative provision um, to. So uh, along with the founders of the Pairs Family School, um, Amy and other colleagues have developed a training for schools. So I, I would like to recommend that and give it a plug. Um, and it is available to book through our website. And this training um, really helps us as teachers, as educationalists to think about um, approaching the work with parents in a in in a partnership uh, in the spirit of partnership um so that we uh look to to be curious and to listen and understand first and i think sometimes that can be the most um sort of powerful um way that we work we work with parents really effectively when we're talking about often quite difficult and challenging topics um around well-being Thank you, Rasheen. Um, Ray, Emma, I don't know if you've got anything that you'd like to add around your work um, with engaging with parents and carers. I'd say one thing, primary school obviously is very different to secondary, but get people on the playground and um, get them to see the faces of who they can maybe speak to um, and also have things on your website. Um, we once put out a, um, a flyer of 
if anyone wants to speak, you can book a separate meeting because we found a lot of parents didn't like to come to coffee mornings because they didn't want to share their problems with a whole group. So that does work. And I would suggest doing a listening group or a coffee morning, but also offering one-to-one sessions. And sometimes it might not be your mental health lead. Sometimes it could be whoever they trust. So tap into that. Don't just think it has to be the person with that title. Same with children, tap into that and, and use that to your advantage. Um, a couple of things. The first thing I, I said in my presentation that we um, have a presence at every event. So rather than it being a special event, a special well-being event, we're there. So if something comes up, rather than the head of year dealing with it, it's like, oh, you can go and talk to the well-being team. Um, again, it's a reason why we did the school production. So that's when you get the most parents through the door we have like audiences of 200 over three you know for three nights so they're there they're looking at the young person performing but there's also this thread of well-being and then they're in those conversations um and then finally something we've done more recently is because we were offering these kind of generic come talk about your you know young person's well-being or mental health and not getting the buy-in we wanted so for instance um after the after the mock exams for year 11 we had a list of young people who overly went to the toilet, didn't write anything or used to put their heads on the desk and be asleep. I'm not painting a very good picture of my school, am I? <laughs> Lots of young people aren't just getting on and doing their. So, so we had that group of young people and we then sort of highlighted them and talked to them and did like a workshop with them about kind of the barriers and that fear of failure and why you wouldn't kind of really engage with um, the exams. And then we, con well, we contacted the parents. So there was a specific reason for them to come and talk to us because it was about supporting their young people through their exams. And, and that worked better than, like I said, this kind of, you know, we're doing a big well-being session, come and talk to us, more specific, more targeted, or yeah, that, that that's how we built our um, parent forum. Thank you so much. Really incredible insights from both of you. Thank you, so helpful. Um, moving on, we've got a, we've actually got a comment from someone, uh, which is quite nice, just an example of something they do around staff wellbeing. We do T4 to Friday, which is our week two timetable. The departments bring in biscuits for all staff to meet in the staff room once a fortnight, at least at break and lunch, which is really nice. Thank you for sharing that, Jacqueline. Um, and someone has asked for a link to the parent and carer partnership training. We will share that for you, no problem. Thank you. Um, I've got another, let me have a look if I've covered. There's someone who's asked about training um, and I guess where to start really with training. So I might go to Rasheen or Amy on this. Is there any particular training um, that they should be looking for that would be helpful. They've been considering mental health first aid youth for schools in their area, but would be good to know, um, yeah, if, if other schools have either tried this or if there's any other recommendations. We're obviously going to be biased here, but I guess just in terms of like, how do you know what to look for when there's so many different trainings out there? Um, I mean, I think um, both Emma and Ray give us some really quite good direction around this already, which I think is to think quite widely about who needs training and not have this just all sit with one person and so this sort of notion of it being a wider team project among among your staff at school um, and so we do recommend some kind of mental health awareness training for everybody and we think that probably the most sustainable way to provide that in schools is um is to, is to be able is to, to be able to own it and do it for yourself and i think amy talked about this um, with our autism and well-being schools training that we that you know we equip um, some members of staff through training with external organizations and then and they share back and disseminate and we have worked with some schools where we've provided a train the trainer model so we've trained uh, uh, the designated leads first of all and then we have also trained them to work with us to develop their own mental health awareness training to deliver to everybody in their school so that can be a really effective model. Um, I think it probably also plays to things which Emma and Ray spoke about around, around identifying, um, Emma particularly talked about this, ad identifying some things you want to address first. So it's sort of thinking about what are your strongest 
priorities. Um, what are you going to do this year and next year? Not trying to do everything all at once. Um, and then, um, you know, targeting what um, small resource you may have to spend on, on professional learning on advancing those those priorities. So kind of thinking about what will that training do for you in terms of your overall plan and, and your kind of direction of travel. It'd be interesting to know what um, trainings Emma and Dre have tried or recommend as well. Yeah, I completely agree. Thank you, Rasheen. And um, is yeah, is there any training Ray or Emma you'd specifically recommend? Well, from my perspective, I think what's happened is depending on your borough. So with our mental health support team, they're actually doing a lot of train the trainer sessions. And then we're I've been able to then deliver them in school and they've been very good. Um, there's also our borough has also linked us with a trauma informed training. But I know that the there's a thing called trauma arc and they have loads of different things that you can go through we also did the anti-racism for staff on um on anna freud um i can try and find it and send it to um the team later we did training on county lines um so there are a few things that i could send but i would again um it is a bit about the needs of your school and deciding what you think and i would i would try and say if possible it might be not just you going on them, but sending staff members on them. Look at what your local authority have. Look at also what is outside and maybe putting staff on like, whether it might be, it might be general courses or try and make sure they're specific because there's nothing worse when you have a member of staff you're trying to support and then they think it's a waste of time. So I'll send some to the team and hopefully they can get that out. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing, Emma. Um, Ray, anything else you'd like to add? Um. The psychological first aid training from Public Health England was really good. We had them in and then they did, like I said, all the TAs and the assistant heads of year. So in one swoop, that kind of, you know, that that brought into staff needs. And it, the, those those members of staff are constantly dealing with young people in a pastoral sense. So that, that was very useful. Um, but I'm, sure, I'm sure all the different boroughs provide training and a Freud as well. And then you'll have experts in your team and I would, they're, they're, they're going to be experts about different things and I think sort of do some in-house things as well. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Ray, as well. I think that, that yeah, perhaps, perhaps there is a lot that can be done in-house. I'm aware that, yeah, obviously there's budgetary constraints for, for every school um, that they have to consider as well. So it's going to be a big factor in that. Um, I think one final question I'm going to ask, and then I think we will um, start wrapping up. But Ray, someone had asked, and this is again linking to sort of finances, how do you get SLT to buy into giving the time for all your days, weeks? The, ti the time for, for what, for who? Um, good question. It just is how do you get SLT buy-in? I think maybe giving the time for, for everything that you're doing around mental health and well-being, perhaps. I, suppose, I mean, it's it's my job. <laughs> so it's so the, I mean that I am SLT and and I suppose you know you look at different settings, but you saw that that slide that I said, you know, up by 485%. I'm sure everyone that works in schools has got the same experience. So it's I suppose you can't ignore the data and you can't ignore our, what our young people are going through so therefore um you know it's important you know they make them yeah so there's i suppose it's not a surprise that a member of slt is leading on well-being and mental health in order to drive it so mm -hmm. i think yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's about prioritization, isn't it? And someone, I think it might be the same person, they've said the time off of the timetable for, for staff and students in curriculum needs. Um well that's measured. We did so the year seven time, um, I'm not yeah, it was a it wasn't wasn't a fight, but I had to make a really clear case for why we'd take an English lesson just, you know, but again, it's that kind of um sort of making so we're not dealing with crisis in year sort of 11 and year 13, you know, how much work can we do in year seven? And so some of those things we did was at summer school as well. So when we were not off timetable um, and then we use some of our we use some of our curriculum time for interventions and, and we've just prioritised that actually it 
in the long run, it does well. But yes, you have to kind of state your case, use the data and put out a long term plan that's part of your action plan. And, and the action plan needs to fit in with the school plan uh, so that everyone's going the same way. I don't know if that's a helpful answer or not. It's incredibly helpful. Yeah, I think it's really helpful. And I think you're right that you kind of have to demonstrate the the long term benefits because it's not always a short term thing. It might be long term um, kind of upfront um, the, the resourcing, but it will benefit longer term. And I think that's a really good point that you made about the action plan linking to your school's action plan and strategy. It makes complete sense. Thank you. And Emma? Just from a primary school perspective, when I started the senior leadership role, I wasn't technically a senior member of staff. And I was also trying to do the whole job role of being a teacher, etc. And that. And then eventually the school listened and actually gate, they do give me two hours or two and a half hours out a week. So you really do need to make sure your whole senior leadership is on board. And that can be hard in the beginning. But data does speak if children aren't achieving and when you have your pupil progress meetings if you are noting on them that it's due to um their well-being that can help you also prove that it's necessary for you to be out unfortunately obviously not that i can comment on the dfe but they there's not allocated time out for a senior mental health leave which i think should be so you do really need to drive it if you're in a primary school um obviously secondary school need is very high it's getting higher in primary school so just keep pushing and you hopefully will get it because you can't also be a senior member of staff and be expected to teach full-time and manage it all so try and get your voice heard Thank you. I think that's probably all we've got time for this evening. But thank you all so much. We're incredibly grateful for the time um, and all of the expertise that you have shared so generously. So Rasheen, Amy, Emma and Ray, thank you so much. I found it extremely informative and I hope that it has been for others on the call as well. I hope that there's something you can take away from this. Um, I definitely think it's clear to see the impact that the training has had. So not only on delegates, but also it's had impact on colleagues, students and your wider communities also. So regardless of whether you are a senior man mental health lead yourself or you work in another role, I hope that there's been some key takeaways from you and maybe something that you can implement in your setting. So thank you all. Um, if you would like to be sent information about all of our upcoming seminars, please do sign up to our Schools in Mind network to hear about it first. And once we close, you're going to be redirected to a feedback form. We would be so appreciative if you could take just a few minutes to complete this form. It really helps us to guide and inform the content of these seminars um, and helps to just ensure that they're as useful as they can be for you. Um, and also we're really keen to continue to support senior mental health leads and we're thinking about ongoing CPD and networking and different opportunities that we can provide. So any feedback that you have around what you would like to see in terms of support and opportunities, we would really love to hear from you. So thank you so much for your time and we hope we'll see you at our next seminar soon. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.